In this video, I will tell you about the events that inspired Nicholas Pelegi to write the book Casino, Love and Honor in Las Vegas. This book in turn served as the basis for the screenplay of Martin Scorsese's cult film Casino. I'll be narrating from the perspective of Frank Collada, an FBI informant pivotal to these events, whose portrayal in the movie underwent significant alterations. Frank Collada was born on December 14, 1938, in an Italian neighborhood of Chicago. Anthony Spilatro, portrayed by Joe Pesci, also hailed from this area. Frank and Tony were peers. They both worked as shoe shiners from a young age and often found themselves in conflicts, dividing the streets between them. Their skirmishes continued until it was suddenly revealed that their fathers were friends. The father of the future informant, Joe Collada, had previously saved the elder Spilatro from the so-called Black Hand, a gang of Italian extortionists. So Tony and Frank became best friends. Frank Collada, whom I will refer to as Frank the Informant to avoid confusion, already had a reputation as a skilled thief by the age of 12. Tony at that time was also involved in robberies, mainly bank messenger heists. Often, this duo pulled off various scams together. Before long, Tony got involved with the Mafia. He didn't want to remain just an ordinary thief. Frank, on the other hand, was less concerned about ties to the Mafia. He simply enjoyed stealing and spending what he stole. Tony, on the contrary, had big ambitions and dreamed of climbing to the top of the Mafia. He was eager to prove himself and earn a reputation. This pivotal moment came for Tony in 1962, when he was just 24 years old. It all unfolded when two henchmen, Billy McCarthy and Jimmy Moralia, committed a grave mistake by eliminating individuals linked to the Mafia without the necessary approval. The bosses demanded justice, and Tony saw an opportunity. As Frank the informant was well acquainted with Billy and Jimmy, Tony asked him to arrange a meeting with Billy. Tony assured his friend that his intention was merely to have a conversation with Billy to resolve the situation. The meeting with Billy was set, and Tony went instead of Frank. Afterward, McCarthy vanished without a trace. Frank immediately understood what had happened. A few days later, Jimmy also disappeared without a trace. Soon, both their bodies were discovered in the trunk of an abandoned car. Later, Tony detailed to Frank how he tortured McCarthy. Tony clamped his head in a vice and squeezed until his eyes bulged from the pressure. Following this incident, Tony's stature within the criminal underworld soared. He amassed several teams of burglars who gave him a cut of their profits, with Frank the informant assuming the role of his trusted right-hand man. Soon, the duo began closely collaborating with Frank Lefty Rosenthal, who also hailed from Chicago. Frank Lefty made his money through gambling. Just as depicted in the film, the real-life Frank Lefty had an approach to betting that was anything but conventional. Every day, he meticulously analyzed around 40 newspapers and had informants everywhere. This network of informants kept him abreast of fixed matches, corrupt judges, and doped-up horses. Frequently seen in the company of renowned mobsters such as James Turk Torello and Joseph Ayupa, Lefty leveraged these connections to gain direct access to the upper echelons of the Mafia. However, despite these close ties, his Jewish background prevented him from fully integrating into the Italian Mafia crime family. One of the most memorable moments in the film, where Joe Pesci's character, Tony, eloquently explains to a disrespectful thug that he's in the wrong, is also based on a true story, although it unfolded slightly differently in reality. Once, in an Italian restaurant, one of the tough guys there insulted Lefty. Tony immediately escorted the man, who was a head taller than him, to the restroom. Customers could hear the slaps and how Tony was berating the guy. Afterwards, they returned to the table and the man apologized to Lefty. While the film portrays events unfolding in the glitz of Las Vegas, the truth is that the entire crew didn't relocate there until much later. The restaurant altercation actually took place in their native Chicago. Likewise, the scene in an airport during which Tony's wife cleverly conceals diamonds in her hair 
transpired in Chicago in 1964. Tony and his wife Nancy underwent scrutiny at Chicago's airport following their return from Europe. During their time in Europe, Tony's family vacationed with the Cook family. John Cook, the head of the Cook family, was a jewel thief. Despite being under constant Interpol surveillance, Tony and Cook managed to orchestrate a daring heist in Monte Carlo, netting half a million dollars worth of jewels, which they skillfully smuggled across borders. In the early 1960s, the newly appointed Attorney General Robert Kennedy initiated an investigation into the Mafia's involvement in illicit gambling operations. The FBI was well aware of Frank Lefty Rosenthal's ties to the Chicago Syndicate. Suspicions arose that beyond overseeing the gambling activities, Frank was also engaged in illegal bookmaking. Despite the FBI's intention to recruit him as an informant, Lefty adamantly refused to cooperate, triggering an intense pursuit. Frank Lefty Rosenthal faced accusations of attempting to bribe a basketball player to manipulate game outcomes. During court questioning, Frank asserted his Fifth Amendment rights, choosing to remain silent. He repeatedly responded with, I don't know, to the prosecutor's inquiries, including a simple question about whether he was left or right-handed. As pressure mounted, telecommunication companies severed ties with Lefty's betting operations. Then the telephone company stopped servicing his home. Rosenthal realized he needed to change his place of residence. During this time, Las Vegas was experiencing phenomenal growth. The city attracted massive investments and tourists flowed in steadily, while legal casinos became its defining symbols. Thanks to Frank's remarkable organizational abilities, and most importantly, his reputation as a trusted man for refusing to cooperate with authorities, he was appointed as the chief of operations in one of the city's premier casinos. In the early 60s, the Chicago Syndicate unofficially owned four major hotels in Las Vegas. Each hotel had its own casino that annually laundered hundreds of millions of dollars. However, determining the true ownership was nearly impossible due to the intricate web of contractors and sponsors documented, allowing Syndicate bosses to operate from the shadows. The bosses received significant contributions in cash from union members. During that period, U.S. unions wielded considerable influence and were predominantly controlled by Italian mobsters. These funds were invested in the construction of casinos. Subsequently, substantial sums of cash were withdrawn from the casino counting rooms to evade taxes and laundered into legitimate businesses. In 1971, Tony Spilatro received directives from the syndicate's leadership to provide Frank Lefty Rosenthal with muscle support. Tony, weary of relentless media and law enforcement scrutiny, eagerly relocated to Vegas, accompanied by his entire family. Upon Tony's arrival, Lefty wasted no time in giving his old friend a tour of the city and cautioned Tony that Vegas operated differently from Chicago and advised him to keep a low profile. Local law enforcement had no qualms about burying any gangster who crossed them in the desert without awaiting trial. Tony silently listened to Frank throughout the trip, nodding in agreement. Contrary to the film's portrayal, Lefty had already married a former exotic dancer named Jerry McKenna before Tony's arrival. In fact, the real-life Rosenthal expressed that Jerry was far more beautiful than Sharon Stone's depiction suggested, indicating his genuine affection for her. The other Frank, the informant, initially couldn't join the company because he had served time from 1968 to 1974 for theft. After his release, he spent some time in Chicago, but eventually moved to Vegas after repeated invitations from his old friend Tony. By that time, Tony had already assembled several criminal crews specializing in home robberies. He had previously paid little heed to Lefty's advice on maintaining a low profile and avoiding unnecessary attention. Lefty had warned him that his close association with the casino could potentially endanger everyone involved if he acted recklessly. 
However, with the arrival of his old friend Frank, the informant, the duo fully immersed themselves in criminal activities. For a while, syndicate bosses turned a blind eye as Frank and Tony effectively safeguarded mafia investments. It was said during that period, the mafia's four hotels were considered untouchable, deterring even the most audacious card sharpers and swindlers. As the film doesn't elaborate on the character of Frank the Informant, Tony in the film personally oversees his criminal enterprise. In reality, Frank the Informant handled the dirty work, extortion, and home robberies, while Tony sold the stolen goods through his network of jewelry stores. On paper, Frank Lefty Rosenthal was merely responsible for entertainment programs in the casino. However, in reality, Lefty was not only involved in the gambling operations but also in money laundering. Once a week, Rosenthal would remove the necessary sum of money from the casino and leave a bag with its contents at a designated location. This process is depicted in the film, although Lefty's involvement is omitted. Additionally, the film falsely claims that Lefty had no access to the casino's Holy of Holies, the counting room, which is untrue. Even I couldn't get inside. Lefty was the most important figure in the casino and had access everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Frank Rosenthal. Over time, Frank Lefty Rosenthal became a public figure in the city. He even had his own television show. Lefty realized that Tony's activities put him at risk and decided to keep his distance. Additionally, Lefty accidentally called his wife on a phone installed in her car. After several rings, Tony's voice came through the receiver. This situation made it clear to Lefty that Jerry was having an affair with Tony. It's worth noting that such behavior among syndicate members was viewed as a display of complete disrespect, which was grounds for a kill order. Unlike the film, where Lefty and Tony communicate on equal terms in reality, Frank was deeply afraid of Tony and didn't react to such an insult. Tony Spilotro became so brazen that he began appearing in public places with Jerry, ignoring his friend Frank the informant's repeated warnings that such actions could lead to serious trouble if discovered in Chicago. In December 1979, Tony Spilotro was blacklisted from all gambling establishments in the state. From that point on, he was prohibited from setting foot on their premises, including casinos owned by the Mafia. Tony became more of a liability than an asset to the bosses. Eventually, Frank, the informant, would even reveal that the FBI surveillance was seen as a form of protection against the bosses from Chicago, who could dispose of them at any moment. In the early 1980s, the FBI had sufficient grounds to launch a full-scale investigation into mafia activities in Las Vegas. Tony and his crew found themselves in a precarious situation, on one side facing federal investigations and on the other disgruntled bosses from Chicago. However, this didn't stop his team from planning new heists. Their new target was a jewelry and antique store. The heist was planned for the night of July 4th to mask any potential noise with fireworks. However, unbeknownst to the gang, the FBI had infiltrated their group. On July 4th at 10.40 p.m., Frank, the informant, observed the robbery from his car. Suddenly, he noticed a group of people approaching them from the darkness. Frank immediately realized it was over. The agents arrested him and five other accomplices. They were all sent to prison. Two weeks later, Tony himself was arrested. Thanks to Tony, trouble spread to Chicago. The syndicate bosses had to change their established operations due to additional FBI investigations, resulting in financial losses. The FBI offered Frank Collada to cooperate, but he didn't immediately agree to become an informant. But after agents played him a recording of a conversation in which Tony blamed Frank for all the troubles and claimed that Frank had gone off the rails, disobeyed him, and was pulling off robberies without his authorization. Tony's interlocutor told him to clean up his mess. Frank knew exactly what that meant. From that moment, Frank became the informant whose revelations formed the basis for the movie. Frank, the informant, provided the FBI with information about all known Mafia members 
and a complete list of Tony's crimes. After that, Tony Spilatro is accused of a double murder of Billy McCarthy and Jimmy Moralia committed by Tony back in 1962. However, even though Frank the informant testified, Tony gets away with it, but the charges against him continue. Meanwhile, on October 4, 1982, an assassination attempt was made on Lefty. After Rosenthal left the restaurant and started his car, there was an explosion. Miraculously, he survived the assassination attempt, thanks to a unique feature of his vehicle. His Cadillac Eldorado 1981 model had a metal plate beneath the driver's seat where the bomb was planted. Lefty refused to pursue the matter further. The identity of the perpetrator of crime remained unknown. The following month, Jerry died from a drug overdose in a Los Angeles motel. By then, she had already divorced Lefty, but he still paid for her funeral. Then Lefty was blacklisted from Nevada's gambling establishments. This prompted his departure from Las Vegas. He shifted his focus to offshore gaming consultations. The State Gaming Commission raided the Mafia's casinos. The bosses were furious as Tony was supposed to protect their investments, but instead cost them millions in losses. In June 1986, a new boss summoned Tony to a meeting in Chicago. Tony's younger brother, Michael, was also invited. Michael was to be promoted. Despite fears, the brothers had no choice but to attend. On June 13, 1986, Tony arrived in Chicago. Michael met him at the airport. The next day, Michael warned his wife that if they didn't return home by 9 p.m., something terrible had happened to them. As you might have guessed, Tony and Michael did not return. The next day, Michael's wife reported his disappearance to the police. Investigators thought the brothers had fled. However, Frank immediately informed the agents that the Spilotro brothers had been liquidated. Frank knew Tony all his life and understood he wouldn't run away. On June 23, 1986, in Indiana, a local farmer discovered freshly dug graves in his cornfield. The police found the bodies of Tony and Michael in their underwear. At the time, it seemed like this murder would remain unsolved. In 2005, nearly 20 years after the deaths of the Spilotro brothers, a trial called Family Secrets took place in Chicago. 18 gangsters were accused of unsolved murders, mainly committed in the 1970s and 1980s. Mafia hitman Nick Calabrese testified about what happened on the night of the Spilotro brothers' murders. The meeting with the brothers was scheduled at a gangster's home. Michael and Tony went down to the basement where they encountered people they knew well. Michael approached them to shake hands, but everyone present was wearing gloves. Then the brothers realized it was the end and Tony asked for time to pray. Michael and Anthony Spilatro were beaten to death with bare hands and feet. The film depicted the scene of Tony's death differently because the case was unresolved at the time of filming. Since 1984, Frank Collada had been under witness protection. In 1994, Frank the informant helped Nicholas Pelagi write the novel and later served as a consultant for the filming of Casino. Frank Lefty Rosenthal also consulted the film crew. He later stated that Robert De Niro brilliantly portrayed him on screen. Frank Lefty Rosenthal died of a heart attack on October 13, 2008. In January 2020, Frank the informant launched his YouTube channel called Mob Vlog. Then, six months later, on August 20th, 2020, Frank the informant passed away in a Las Vegas hospital due to complications from the coronavirus. Thank you for watching the video to the end. I hope you had a good time. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You'll discover plenty of other captivating videos waiting for you there.